This episode is brought to you by our Patreon members. Join our growing community for early access to every episode, exclusive video versions of the podcast, behind-the-scenes footage, full-length product demos, and more. We appreciate you. Hi everyone, this is Jason, back for part two of our museum tour with Martins and more. We just have so much great stuff here, we could, couldn't fit it into one episode, and we didn't want to rush through, we wanted to take our time, so we'll jump back in and pick up from where we left off last time. So in this case here, this represents 1986 to 2005, so what's significant about 1986 is that's when C.F. Martin IV, Chris Martin, took over as CEO and chairman of the board for Martin Guitar. And at the time when he took over, uh, you know, it was a little rough. Uh, sales had gone way down. Martin had made a bunch of acquisitions that didn't work out. Financially, the company wasn't in that great of shape, but uh, things started to improve. Uh, luckily, a few years later, MTV released their unplugged TV show, which was really important for Martin guitar and for acoustic guitars in general because the performers on that show were playing acoustic instruments and so interest in the guitars that they were playing started to grow and Martin could see this as you know, sales started to pick up. You know, a lot of people were wondering, well, what's Eric Clapton playing on Unplugged or, you know, the other acts that played. Uh, one of the more famous acts to play on Unplugged and, and, and then release uh, a live album of that show was Nirvana. Uh, on, that sh on that show, Kurt Cobain played a 1959 D18E. Uh, we happen to have the D18 that Kurt Cobain owned before he owned that D18E. This is a 1953 D18. Uh, originally, it was owned by Mary Lou Lord, who was a folk uh, musician in the Boston area. And she became friends with Kurt Cobain right around the time that Nirvana released their Unplugged album. Uh, you know, they hit it off, started dating. Nirvana was touring to support Nevermind. And she knew that Kurt needed a guitar, an acoustic guitar for the tour. And they both loved it. They nicknamed it Grandpa because, you know, it was kind of old and beat up. <laughs> it sounded great, but uh, appearance-wise, it was a little rough. So Mary Lou ended up giving Kurt Grandpa. And then uh, he used it for a while, uh, you know, like I said, in support of the Nevermind album. <laughs> yeah, that's some extreme buckle rash there. Uh, so I guess the story goes that Kurt started dating Courtney Love. She was like, oh, it's a cool guitar, where'd you get it? And uh, Kurt said, you know, from Mary Lou. And so Courtney Love was like, oh, you have to give it back. So Kurt Cobain, you know, gives it back to Mary Lou. And then she ends up meeting Elliot Smith, loans it to Elliot Smith. He plays it for a while. Uh, and then, you know, after the guitar is returned to Mary Lou, she kind of feels that the guitar is cursed because of how both Kurt Cobain and Elliot Smith died. Wow. So she ends up getting rid of it, and then we purchased it at an auction uh, a little while after that. But uh, one of the things that Kurt Cobain's D18E sold at an auction in 2020 for $6 million, uh, the most expensive guitar ever to sell. So, I mean, if we would put a, a similar value on this, because, you know, Kurt did play it and, uh, you know, owned it for a while. I mean, it's, it's pretty uh, insane to think about a guitar being worth that much, but I mean, when, when they're used by such an iconic musician like Kurt Cobain, who has so many fans out there, who knows you know, what they would be willing to pay for it. Exactly. Then, of course, next to it, in the case, we have the D1228 that was loaned to Courtney Love for Holes Unplugged performance. And for some reason, she uh, got upset with uh, the guitar player in the band and ended up throwing the guitar across the stage. That's why the electronics <laughs> are on the top of it now instead of being inside. That's not your typical battery placement, right? No, no. <laughs> Unless you want to use the battery as a slide. That's been done. 
A few years after the Unplug show uh, was released, Martin started uh, our artist relations program. And in that program, we've worked with uh, around 130 artists to build signature models where you know, we d design the guitar with them and then the proceeds from the sales go to a charity of their choice. Now, a couple of the, the big artists that we've done signature models with are Johnny Cash, uh, John Mayer, I mean, Mark Knopfler, Elizabeth Cott, and Roseanne Cash, Kevin Moe, I mean, you can go on and on, Buddy Guy, it's like across uh, really all genres, you know, it's definitely a lot in bluegrass and country music like Lester Flatt, George Jones, Porter Wagner, we could talk all day about those, <laughs> but we have a couple of the uh, signature models here. This is a, a D42 Johnny Cash. And Johnny Cash actually used this guitar for a while. So when uh, he was given prototype number one of the edition, and he was on stage, had a bit of a stage accident, and while his guitar was being repaired, we loaned this to him. And so it's you know, really cool that the, the man in black got to play this guitar for a while. We have it in our collection. And uh, just a, an interesting note, if you happen to be in Washington, D.C., you go to the U.S. Capitol. In Emancipation Hall, there is now a statue of Johnny Cash in there because each state gets to have two statues of figures representing their state. And Arkansas just unveiled yesterday, September 24th, uh, their Johnny Cash statue. That's awesome. Wow. You know, typical three-piece back, because that's what, you know, Johnny Cash liked his D35, so this technically is a, a style 42, but we did the three-piece back on it. I'm pretty sure I know part of the details, but what's up with the dollar bill? Uh, that, that's how Johnny got his signature sound. You know, him and the, the Tennessee 2, uh, they had that, you know, that train sound, that rhythmic, uh, and that's kind of how Johnny got that sound on the acoustic was, you know, put a dollar bill in the strings and, uh, you know, definitely uh, unique. And that's one of the things about Johnny Cash when you, you know, hear, doesn't necessarily even have to be his voice, but when you hear one of his songs, you can tell who it is just because of how unique the sound is. Uh -huh. It's also a cheap way to increase the value of that instrument in the museum, right? <laughs> yeah, put, a, put an extra <laughs> dollar in it, yeah. <laughs> Hopefully we insure it for that. Dad jokes are no extra charge at Martin's and more. <laughs> uh, one of the other notable signatures edition, signature editions is the OM28 John Mayer. The first signature edition uh, we did with him. And really when you talk about collectible guitars of the past you know, 20 some years, that might be number one. Just because I me mean, Martin only built uh, 404 and you know they had no issue selling them out and now they're really highly sought after but it has elements that were inspired by some uh watches that john owns like the diving symbol on the uh fingerboard yeah we did a few recreations of this i should say in a, in a broad sense at maury's music a few years back where minus the inlay obviously mm -hmm. minus the signature we did sort of give our customers a short run of what that could have been if you bought it again today, but it's, it's you know, still entirely lacking all the value. Yeah, because, <laughs> I mean, one of the things, you can, you can build it uh, a custom close to a signature edition, but all of the elements that make it a signature edition, like signatures, the specific inlay, the interior labels, you know, obviously we can't do those. Exactly. Now I'm going to pull this guitar out tell you why it's hanging backwards. So one of the things that we did was when we uh, revamped our museum in 2021 was I wanted us to focus on some musicians that you might not think of when you think of Martin guitar because yeah people know from country, bluegrass, you know even rock but when you think of Motorhead you really don't think of Martin guitar but this guitar was loaned to Motorhead uh, now, this wasn't out of rage or anything like that, or a, a stage act. This was just an accident. It was dropped. Uh, I mean, they did end up paying for it. They felt bad about it, but it just goes to show that even 
you know, heavy metal bands, when they're playing acoustic guitars, they choose Martins also. <laughs> you said Motorhead, right? Motorhead, yeah. I have to really be sure that I'm hearing that correctly. Yep, Motorhead. <laughs> Those of you watching the YouTube version of this video, if you thought I knew everything about this museum, I did not. <laughs> what a great lesson, Jason. Anybody who thinks they've seen this before, yeah. you owe it to yourself to make a second trip. Is yeah, and, and if you haven't been here uh, since 2019, because obviously 2020 nobody was here, uh, but you know, we, ha we did revamp the museum, officially opened it in uh, 2021 in, in, in the fall. And one of the things that we did was we wanted to consolidate what we have because we have almost 200 years of history in here and a limited amount of space. So that's what we kind of did. We looked at some items, you know, how could we shrink down and redesign the cases to fit more in. And I mean, the flow of the museum now goes along with leadership changes to the company mostly. You know, we have C.F. Martin Sr. and C.F. Martin Jr. Frank Henry Martin, C.F. Martin III, Frank Herbert Martin, C.F. Martin IV. And the way it's laid out, it's, you know, changes in that leadership or when we get up to Chris, uh, change from, you know, this case here ends in 2005, and then we wrap around to 2006 when the museum was opened. So we try to lay it out that way. Uh, just, you know, give it a, a uh, just this, layout that we thought would make sense and that way we could also illustrate some of what's been going on lately because we realized we didn't have the past 20 or so years of history in the museum at that point. Oh wow. Uh, but back to this case, I know I wandered off a little bit there. <laughs> uh, in the late 1990s Martin started using uh, high pressure laminate HPL for our X-series guitars. Uh, it's just, you know, one of those wood alternatives because Martin Guitar was the first guitar company to enact an ecological policy, and that was in 1990. And, you know, we've looked to alternative sources for the tone woods that we use, and one of them happened to be HPL. Uh, you know, our X-Series guitars, they're in a price point that's a lot more affordable to people than, you know, say something in our standard series or something in our, uh, built out of our Nazareth factory, like the 15 series and up. And I mean, you get a great sound from them, and they're, and they're pretty durable instruments. Uh, we also started looking to alternative solid woods, especially when we were working with, with Sting on his signature edition. So the conservation of natural resources was very important to Sting when we went to build his signature models. So we needed to make sure that the woods we were using were harvested responsibly, and that's when we started using, you know, catalogs for fingerboards and bridges the tops were either reclaimed from bridge timbers or uh, logs that were saved from pulp mills, and then we were using woods like cherry for the back and sides. So it's just kind of one of those other steps into you know a lot of the ways we build now because, I mean, yeah, if people had their choice, they would have you know rosewood, mahogany, ebony on their guitar, but we don't know if those woods are always going to be around. And so one of the things we need to do is try these different woods and to show, yeah, we can build a guitar out of these woods that's just as good as anything built out of rosewood or mahogany. Good point. Now, before we wrap around to the case that starts in 2006, we're gonna take a look at this exhibit we opened recently. Uh, so this is uh, the part of the Tom Gibran collection. So Tom and his family have run the Trans Transbridge bus lines for over 80 years now. So family-owned company, they're in Bethlehem, PA, you know, about 20 minutes from our factory here in Nazareth. And Tom has been a guitar player since he was a teenager. And his first good guitar was a Martin GT75. Uh, and that's what started him on his journey of collecting Martin electrics. So here we have five of Tom's F-series electrics that Martin started building in 1961. We have the F-50, F-55, and F-65. So Martin built 15 prototypes of each in 1961. They went in the catalogs in 1962. Uh, they were sold through 1965. Martin also sold 
these 112 amps along with them. The amps were, weren't built by Martin, they were built by DeArmond, but they're you know, really great sounding tube amps, so if you can find one of those now, you know, I highly recommend them. Uh, now, Martin Electrics, they didn't do that great in sales-wise. Uh, the most notable guitarist to use one uh, was Johnny Guitar Watson, blues player from Houston, Texas. But, I mean, they're definitely interesting. Uh, you know, they, they, they just go to show that Martin wasn't afraid to try to do something different. They saw, you know, electric guitar sales were increasing. They saw how well Fender was doing and, you know, Gretsch and huh. decided to, you know, build something along those lines. Just, you know, expand just like the company did when they got in the mandolins and ukuleles. Uh, I mean, electric guitar sales weren't that great, but Martin did the F series until 65, then they released the GT series. So in this exhibit, we're going to uh, highlight Tom's F series first, and then for six months, and then for the next six months, we're going to put his GT series guitars in here. So you have the DeArmond pickups on here. This is the F65. Are they anything like Filtertrons? Yeah, yeah, that's... Uh, Kind of the basic idea, I think, of the Filtertron. Very similar. Of course, you have this Biz, Bigsby-esque tailpiece. That's gorgeous. Now, the reason why Martin called these the F-Series, they took the dimensions off of the F-Series arch tops that they built in the 30s and 40s, and that's what created the size of the body. Obviously not the depth of the body, but your width and length. Yeah, I mean, they're, they're cool guitars, pretty collectible now. Uh, one of the unique things about these is that originally they used plexiglass bridges. So Tom has been trying to acquire these for his guitars. So he sent in a few of them to display here. Uh, eventually the company switched over to uh, Rosewood Bridges because they found that they sounded better. Rosewood sounded better, just making a mental note. Yeah, I'm a big Ro Rosewood fan. Rosewood sounded better than plexiglass. Some of my viewers are going to say Rosewood sounded better, end of sentence. <laughs> That's just to start a, a fun fight on YouTube. Look at that. Oh. When it comes to what, fingerboard and bridge or? Anything. Rosewood's yeah. better than everything. And I ah. just, I kind of like, I'll die on that hill sort of thing. <laughs> but that's pretty. Can I ask you a personal question? Sure. How sad is it that you can't play any of this stuff because you're left-handed? Ah, uh, I mean, <laughs> it's a little rough. I can play them upside down, but. Not like I could play them if they were strung yeah. left-handed. <laughs> Still, one of these days, we're going to acquire a lefty for the museum. We tried to get a, a, 19, a original factory lefty 1935 0 28 a few months ago. Uh, didn't work out, but we're going to find one. Is there no lefty at all in here? No, we don't have any lefties really? in the collection. What nope. a sin. Yeah, I know. Well, let's go talk that's, to HR. That's the plight of the left-handed guitarist, oh, though. I was just making an innocent joke, but I feel rotten now. <laughs> yeah. Ah, oh, well, what can you do? So I'm going to turn this switch off here. We're going to take a look at serial number one million. So this is the one millionth Martin ever built. Uh, the inlay was done by an inlay, Rob uh, inlay artist named Larry Robinson. Uh, he's from California, and I mean, he hand cuts everything. He doesn't use any kind of CNC. You know, it's all hand inlaid. So this guitar took about a year to build. And you yeah. can see a lot of elements from Martin's past on the guitar on the pick guard. There's an X brace top, and then on the back, <laughs> forgot. We can see C. F. Martin Senior down here, a style for style guitar. Martin Dreadnought. Looks like a triple O or OM. Does that weigh like 16 pounds with all that stuff on it? Probably. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's hefty. Might still weigh less than the Les Paul we have over in the, in the one case. <laughs> wow. 
But I mean, guitars like this, when we reach this spe a specific serial number, you know, these milestone instruments, they, they are pretty much works of art. Uh, you know, you, if you get into this, the discussion about weight in guitars, you know, a lot of people, you know, obviously acoustic guitar, you want it to be as light as possible. But I mean, for this, this, you know, you can play it, but it was, it, this was built as more of a showpiece. Sure. Uh, and kind of to illustrate, you know, the height of what uh, an acoustic guitar can be as far as design, inlay design. Wow. Do you remember who was all part of the uh, design team on that, like figuring out what to do? Uh, I mean, usually when it comes to instruments like this, it's Chris Martin, Tim Teal. Uh, a lot of times Robert Getzel will be involved. And then obviously whoever we're working uh, with to build the, the guitar. Mm -hmm. On someone's desk somewhere, there's an order for how much pearl to order on that instrument. I'd love to see that yeah. receipt someday. Not even just for the value, but for how many pieces. Yeah. Well, we did build the D100 based off of serial number 1 million. Uh, so you could buy that. I think the last time it was in our catalog, it was 115000 Yeah. So, uh, I mean, I, we sold all 50 of the edition. Wow. So, uh, I mean... That kind of goes to show that people are out there have are willing to spend that much money on a Martin acoustic that they feel you know it's definitely worth it. You're buying a milestone in history, really. Yeah. So here we pick up uh, 2006 when the museum opened here to the present, and I mean, shortly after that, Martin celebrated the 175th anniversary of the company. So we have a couple of special instruments in here. A lot of people are probably familiar with this guitar just because of the top. In 2008, Morton built the LX-175 and the DX-175. Now this is the hand-painted original that Robert Getzel painted. So the artwork on those two models was based off of this. So as you can see, CF Martin Sr., Stafford Guitar, North Street Factory. We have the interior label on a, what on a Martin guitar, the you know, interior labels were used during the early years of the company. And then of course we have the non-multa said multum, the Martin family logo, not many but much, you know, that quality over quantity saying. Hmm. I mean, now we kind of say quantity and quality. I was say, that's, but, that's old. <laughs> I mean, compared to some builders, you know, we're building 100,000 guitars a year. That's still, you know, small compared to some builders out there. But uh, yeah, you know, quality and quantity. But it's not 71 guitars a year anymore. Nope. So one of the other guitars I wanted to add was this. You know, illustrating again that Martin just isn't for the country player, the bluegrass player. If you're not familiar who Steve Jones is, he's the guitarist from the Sex Pistols. You know, one of the uh, original punk bands. And this is his D28 Authentic oh. that he had custom painted and his, his name inlaid in the fingerboard. Really, I never mm -hmm. saw that. Yeah. It doesn't scream anarchy as much as I would expect. <laughs> Maybe irony. <laughs> wow. I w if you would have said, pick out the Sex Pistols guitar, <laughs> and, and even narrowed me down to this, this glass, I wouldn't have picked nope. that. Yeah. A lot of people wouldn't have known that, wouldn't have guessed it. But hey, when guitarists want a good acoustic guitar, you know, they choose Martin. And it doesn't matter what kind of music they play or you know what, it's, you know, it's just Martin has that reputation of quality and tone and that's what guitarists look for. Yep. Preach, baby, preach. <laughs> uh, here we have a couple of our authentic models. So, you know, people that are into vintage acoustic guitars, I mean, the major drawback of them is the price. 
I mean, it'd be great if you could, you know, own a 1937 D28, but who, you know, not all of us have a hundred plus thousand dollars laying around to buy one. So that's why we build our authentics. We try to replicate a specific instrument as closely to po as closely as possible. I mean, right now we're building our D18 and D28 authentic 1937. And when we build the authentics, what we do is we try to replicate those instruments as closely as possible. So we take a guitar from our collection normally and x-ray it so we can see what, exactly how the bracing looks and you know, use finishes that are similar. We have the finishing instructions from the 1930s in our archives. So here we have a couple of, we have the D28 authentic, we have the OM45 Deluxe authentic. Um, we talked about that guitar in the first episode, you know, being worth around $300,000. I mean, this guitar, we sold 11 of them, like the original edition, and they were 100000 Yep. So not quite the bargain that maybe a D28 Authentic is that's, you know, 9000 but still. Relatively could, speaking, could, yeah. could save you 200000 Sure. We had one of them at the store uh, yeah. maybe five or six years ago, and I would... Uh, not that I didn't sleep at night, but I was a little bit <laughs> anxious before it actually shipped to the, the rightful owner in New York City after yeah. all those years, and it was just, thank God that's out of here. <laughs> you know. So this is our moon landing guitar. 2019, it was the 60th anniversary of NASA's moon landing, and we did a, a joint venture with them and built two of these, one for NASA and one for us. And what's so cool about guitars like this, it illustrates what we can do with the Mamaki printers we have. So we have a couple of them now. And so this image is printed directly on a spruce top. And then, you know, we finish right over it. So it's not like, I mean, HPL is a little different where that image is kind of part of the laminate material. This is a solid piece of wood that we print on, and it's similar to what we do with uh, the Biosphere models. You know, Robert Getzel does the artwork, and then, you know, we print them on, apply the finish over it. So it's just another unique way that Martin can make something that is different than, you know, what other makers are building at the time. Could you speak to how that affects the guitar's top compared to like a sunburst or regular other coloring? It's very similar. So, you know, weight-wise, it would be similar to having a, sun, a sunburst or, uh, you know, some kind of shaded top sprayed on there. So it doesn't add a ton of extra weight to it. Not drowning in, in no. paint? No. Yeah, gotcha. And, you know, most of our guitars now have some kind of toner on the top, like the vintage toner, kind of like this you know, John Mayer we have here. Uh, and so they have a little something on the top to begin with, and it, you know, it doesn't really affect the sound. It's such a, you know, it's a lightweight material, and it, it does allow the, the top to vibrate, the guitar to breathe some. Well, that's a really good point. Even guitars that aren't colored don't assume that they're, there's nothing on it. Yeah. yeah. I mean, th this is a good guitar for all the uh, Orange County Chopper fans out there, American Choppers. This was a collaboration we did with Paul Jr. Designs. I remember when that happened, yeah. Yeah, so we built uh, seven of these custom shop guitars, and we built, and they built the uh, reverse trike that's usually in our lobby here at the factory. Uh, we did switch that out recently for a 1963 Porsche to go along with our electric guitar exhibit because they're, you know, similar time frame. But... Uh, they filmed two uh, episodes on this collaboration. Uh, one of the episodes focused on the planning process and you know the building of the trike and the guitar, and the second episode was the unveiling of both. And as part of that, all of the employees here, we went down into the sawmill, and they had Mario Andretti drive the trike into the <laughs> sawmill and you know present it to us, and then we presented. Uh, the guitar to Paul Jr. So this is a really cool experience. That was fun. Wonder how many of our viewers know how far Mario had to travel to get to Martin Guitar. <laughs> Here's a hint, not very far. <laughs> so we talk a, uh, a lot about innovations when we go through the museum. You know, X bracing, the orchestra model, the dreadnought, and our latest. Uh, 
One of our latest innovations is the SC13E and the SC line of guitars. Uh, the 13-fret body, the linear dovetail neck joint, really completely removing that heel. So if you haven't tried one of these yet, I highly recommend them, especially if you uh, are an electric guitar player. You know, you like to go back and forth between electric and acoustic, but acoustics really don't feel that comfortable to you. You know, strings are heavier or whatever. You know, we do use custom lights on these guitars, set up the action a little bit lower. Uh, so they are a little more comfortable, a little easier to play. Uh, they have Fishman or LR Bags Electronics, depending on the model. But here we have some of the original elements. That's a copy of Fred Green's original drawing for, that inspired the SC. Oh, wow. He wanted the body, because if you heard the story, it kind of leans to kind of be looking forward, to looking towards the future of, guitar, of acoustic guitar building. Yeah, and I'm on record telling a lot of our customers, uh, if you want to play a comfortable acoustic guitar, you don't have to be one of those players who uses every fret or plays above no. the small fret. This is extremely comfortable everywhere mm -hmm. on the neck. Even if you play in the first position, it's recognizably mm -hmm. different from anything you guys have built before. Yeah, it is. Now, this is one of the first molds for the body. Oh, got the box stuck to it. No. Maybe Robert did that on purpose so it wouldn't fall off. Maybe that's a part of the new version. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like you, you attach that to your belt buckle and that way you don't lose your guitar. Hey, maybe that's why that Kurt Cobain grandpa looks so bad. <laughs> yeah. Maybe that was something he used to do. <laughs> There's that elephant that was in the other episode. Yeah. <laughs> Making noises upstairs. <laughs> now here we have serial number two million the watch guitar. So if you look closely, there is an actual working timepiece inlaid in the headstock. Now this timepiece was built by Roland Murphy, a custom watchmaker from Lancaster, Pennsylvania. And the guitar replicates everything in that watch. So the way the body is designed, the time track, everything. Uh, and then the back is very similar. You see the same gears blown up that you would see in the back of the of the uh, timepiece. So obviously the theme for this is the passage of time. It took from 1833 to 2017 for the company to build two million guitars. And then based off of this, we're building uh, the D200. We're still building that, that edition. Uh, forget what the price is for a D200 now. I think around, I think it's 135,000. Wow. But you do get a $9,000 custom watch with it. Oh, that's so right. <laughs> an extra incentive to buy one. Can I see the back of that please in the oh, light? Yeah. Maybe under this, is it any brighter over here? Sorry. Uh, I mean, oh, that's not bad. Say, so if you want, we can go over by the uh, museum bench. I have the oh, yeah. workbench over there, that's really good lighting. What is going on? So this is uh, the theme of the guitar is the passage of time, because it took from hey. 1833 until 2017 to build two million guitars. So there's an actual working timepiece in the headstock, and then the guitar replicates the timepiece. I mean, Martin has pretty much been involved in strings throughout the history of the company, but it was in 1970 when Frank Herbert Martin decided to buy the Darko Strings Company. That when, that's when Martin Strings was truly born. And I mean, we still build our own strings now. We, fit, we feel we build the best acoustic guitars in the world and we need the best strings to go on them. And that's why we build our own. All of our strings uh, are built in our factory in Navajo, Mexico. And also in Navajo, we build our LX guitars, our backpackers, our junior series, our road series. So a lot of great instruments in our factory there. And I mean, it started there with uh, strings and kind of evolved to uh, those other instruments. But I mean, it just kind of shows the evolution of the packaging here in the case. And I mean, some of our newest offerings like uh, the Kovar line, you know, we just try to, like we do with guitars, innovate something different, something new, something that we think would benefit 
uh, the guitar player today. And really, I mean, a lot of people like that phosphor bronze sound, but they want a string that's a little bit more durable, a little more corrosion resistant. And, you know, they, they don't want to go with a treated string because they could go with our SPs that are treated. So the Kovars are a great alternative because you get more of the sound of a phosphor bronze string, but a string that is highly corrosion resistant, you know, will last you a long time. Without being treated. Without being treated. And what gauge are these over here? Uh, I think uh, on the high E, that's a 120, and then on the <laughs> low E, that's a 500. <laughs> 500. Yeah. It's like a rebar. Yeah. What size bridge pins do I need for that <laughs> guitar in the case at Martin? Wow. Look like they were made out of bowling pins, I think. I was going to say that. I'm yeah. looking for the ball. <laughs> Even the saddle's compensated. Look, I was going to make a joke, but it really is. Hey. <laughs> Bravo. Look at every last detail here. Bravo. Good saddle height. All right. I'm going to give that a, a B plus. <laughs> of course, in the museum, we have our stage. So somebody wants to come in here, pick up one of these guitars, and play a song they can. Uh, that's what, I mean, these two guitars are on display for. Anybody can come in here, pick them up get pictures with them, or like I said, if they want to play a song, feel free. And we also have a couple of these, uh, we have the beat seat and a cajon here, just in case, you know, you bring a drummer with you, wants to lay down uh, some percussion. Last but not least, Last but not least, that's right. So this is a, uh, an exhibit that we rotate usually every year or so. And right now we have this focus on sustainability. We opened it on Earth Day this year at the same time we released our Biosphere 2 model. Uh, and I mean, sustainability is really at the core of what Martin Guitar does as a company, the way we build, the way we operate. I mean, we want to be sustainable not only with using woods that are harvested sustainably, but with the way that we run our factories, you know, the lighting we use, uh, you know, a lot of the uh, infrastructure here. So wherever we think we can be more sustainable, be a better partner to the environment, the community, you know, be a better partner to our colleagues here at Martin Guitar. That's what we're going to focus on. That's what we're going to do. And this is just kind of an evolution of some of the sustainable models that we built through the years, starting with uh, the SWD back in the late 1990s. We had the Smartwood series of guitars with uh, the reclaimed spruce tops and cherry back and sides. I mean, put a you know a couple of unique instruments in here, like the alternative model with the aluminum top, but that has sustainable cherry back and sides also. Oh, I forgot that was sustainable. Yeah, it is sustainable. I mean, we had the uh, Alt X's that had the HPL back and sides with this model. You know, it's solid wood. Uh, came with Fishman Electronics. And then, of course, when we uh, opened this case, we released the Biosphere 2, which you can see the back here. It's one of our slope shoulder dreadnoughts, but this is a copy, or not a copy, this is the original artwork that Robert Getzel did for that edition. Oh, that's beautiful. So the proceeds of this model are going to the Caring for Calves Foundation in Hawaii that looks after uh, the waters where these whales, uh, the, the calf and the mother live. At times they are endangered and to make sure that you know, like the Biosphere 1 we did with coral reefs, just bringing attention to causes like this that a lot of people might not think about every day. Now, I'll show you one last guitar, and this is uh, really our, our latest innovation, the GPCE Inception. And so this is maple back and sides, walnut wedge in the middle. 
And when we were designing this guitar, we wanted to look at, uh, at a way we can use domestic hardwoods because, I mean, with domestic hardwoods, they grow a lot faster, a lot, you know, than tropical tone woods do. And we wanted to see if there was a way we could use woods like that to create a guitar that has the Martin sound because, you know, Martin's built maple guitars in the past, but they might not have the sound that you're looking for. But when we set out to build this model, kind of we built it around that sound. One of the things that we do on these models that is a little different than other guitars that we build, we use skeletonized bracing where we laser out sections and that helps to lighten the brace, give it a different sound. We're also using sonic channels in the top and the back. So if you get a chance to uh, go out and play one of these, I highly recommend it. Uh, the tops on these are certified European spruce, so it is an FSC certified top. So, I mean, that, that's one of the things. We need to, you know, try to make these guitars and try to encourage people to go out and play them because, yeah, everybody wants a D28, everybody wants a D18, but when we're looking 50 years down the road, we don't know if we're gonna be able to build those anymore. So guitars like this may be the guitar of the future. Thanks everybody for watching part two of the museum tour with Martins and more. And if you wanna come visit our factory, please do. We love visitors here. We have factory tours uh, that are run Monday through Friday, 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. And our museum is open Monday through Friday, 8.30 to 4.30 p.m.